Would you please pick up your Bible if you have one today or turn with me in your smartphone, you version app, to the book of Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10. There's just so many ways you can have the Word of God in this hour. Everybody ought to have a copy of the Word of God on them all the time. Amen. How many of you thank God for the Bible? Amen. It's the most important book that's ever been because it shows us the way and the words of life. I want to go to Joshua chapter 10 today, and this is, this is not part of a series. In two weeks, um, a new series called Unstoppable begins in two weeks, November the 11th, and uh, it's going to be focusing on us, us having a life of vision and bringing a fresh revelation of what vision is about and what it does in our lives. It helps us to see what God wants us to see about where we need to go with our lives. Are you grateful that we've got a God who wants us to move forward? Amen? Amen. So in Joshua chapter 10 today, this is a standalone message, but um, God's got something special to put into your life. I'm going to read some very unique scriptures. But then Joshua chapter 10 is a very unique chapter. The, the sun, God has caused the sun to stand still in order that a battle could be won for his people. That's not what I'm reading about. But that's one of the cool things that happened in this chapter. But in verses 24 and 25, and I'm going to read verse 26 as well. It says, Joshua 10, 24, So it was when they brought out those kings to Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who went with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. Notice that. And they drew near and put their feet on their necks. Then Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of a good courage, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Graphic. Verse 26. And afterward Joshua struck them and killed them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging on the trees till evening. I want to use for a subject for the next few moments this morning. God is able. God is able. Now, if you read those verses and you don't understand everything that's going on around those verses, you won't understand the reason why God had Joshua deal so strongly with those enemies. It is because when you become an enemy to God's purpose and plan, it's a crazy thing that God's creation would rebel against him, rise up against him, and fight him, and fight and hate his cause. There comes a point, and there came a point with these these kings and their kingdoms that were determined to be enemies of God and his people, that God dealt strongly and firmly with them, totally defeating them because God had a purpose that he wanted to bring to pass in his people. Verse um, 22 said, he said, open the mouth. And you don't have that verse, I don't think, team. But he said, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings to me from the cave. Drag those kings. Pay attention with me now. Track with me. Drag those kings out of the darkness. They did all the things they could. Then they ran back to the darkness. And see, these kings represent to us today, they represent to us today evils that are out of control. And they represent to us in this message today the five senses that we deal with in life. Senses that in the natural are a blessing to us. To be able to see, to be able to hear, to be able to feel, to be able to touch, to taste. That's, that's, a, that's a powerful thing. But in the spirit realm, those senses can be diabolical against you having a faith life and believe in God for things. 
And I'm going to show you that as sure as God instructed Joshua to drag those kings, those evil and wicked kings, out of those caves, bring them out of the darkness, expose them in the light, and put your foot on their necks and show them openly that the enemy of God is not going to mock God and that defeat comes to the enemies of God and his people. And he dealt very strongly with that. And see, in this message today, uh, it's important that we choose a life of bold faith because fear is something that will dominate your life if you don't choose to live a life that's yielded to and given over to the faith choice. Fear is a dark room where, you're, where you develop your negatives. And you don't need that in your life. I'm going to say that again. Fear is a dark room where you've developed your negatives. Fear is false evidence that appears real. Fear is faith gone mad. It is the very opposite of it. And, and, and fear is something that if Satan can get you to operate in it, he will intimidate you out of your future. But I've come to remind every Christ follower today, not only are you different, but you are no longer exclusively your own. You have been bought with a price. You belong to Jesus Christ. You are part of the church of the living God. You are the temples of the Holy Ghost. The Lord doesn't abide in a beautiful box any longer called the Ark of the Covenant, but He abides in the heart and in the soul and in the person of every true believer in this room, in this nation and around this planet. Can you give him praise in this room for his wonderfulness? God is able to help you live a life of light and to live a life in faith. These five kings represent to us once again the senses that we will deal with. The first king, the first sense that we need to put our foot on his neck is the sense of smell. The sense of smell. In Daniel chapter 3, there was a decree made by a man who was just given over to total self-absorption. Nebuchadnezzar was so all about himself and, and he, had, he believed he was a god. He, he, he believed that he had godlike status. And he builds an image of gold and commands music to be played and tells everybody within his kingdom to bow down when the music plays. And he says, oh, by the way, if you don't, I'm going to throw you in a fiery furnace. It's in your Bible if you got one. Going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Well, everybody applied situation ethics. I didn't, no matter what they believed, they changed their belief because they didn't want to be deep fried. They didn't want to be roasted. You know what I'm saying? But there were three guys, three fellas, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three men who when the music played, they weren't trying to be defiant, but they already had a true and a living God. They were men in leadership, and they weren't trying to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. But here's the thing. If leadership ever asks you to defy God, now let me clarify something. If leadership asks you to do something that your personal rebellion doesn't want to do, that's a different animal right there. there you have the issue then. But if leadership asks you to do something in any form of leadership that denies God and that lifts something up else above God, you need to do exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego modeled because they did not bow when the music played. They did not worship. They, they stood there. You know, like the three elephants in the room, man. They stood there. Everybody else is doing it, but they're standing there. And they're, they're not engaging in. They're not, they're not succumbing. They're not cowing down. And word got back to Nebuchadnezzar from some people that were jealous and didn't much appreciate Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, and said, uh, those three guys, some of your leaders, didn't bow down when the music played and worship your golden image. And so he said, well, let me talk to those guys. And he has them brought to him. And they stand in his presence. And Nebuchadnezzar asks them about it and gives them a chance to give an account. And they said, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't really have to think much about this. Now, most things you need to think way more than you do before you speak. But there are some things you don't have to fast about, you don't have to pray about, you don't have to take a lot of time on because the decision's already been made. As it comes to bowing down to that image, we're not going to do that. We will never do that. We have a God already. He's the most high God. 
We will not bow down to that. And I know you don't like that. And it's, it's nothing personal. But if you throw us in the fire, our God is still able to deliver us from a fire you throw us in. And he will, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, sir, deliver us out of your hand. Would you shout, God is able? Well, he was not a lying devil. He was a, he kept his word mean kind of devil, Nebuchadnezzar. And he had them thrown into the fire, but he was so hateful, rotten, crazy mad, he said, heat that fire as hot as you can get it. They heated that fire seven times hotter than it had been. And they went to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. The Bible said the fire was so intense that it came out of that furnace and killed the men that threw them into the fire. But when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were tossed over into it, the only thing that burned off of them was the things that bound them. And Nebuchadnezzar goes to kind of freaking out. And he looks in that fire. How many of you know if you was a devil, it just it seems, if you were devilish, if you were wicked, and you did something to somebody who knows the true and the living God, and he came down and got in the mess with them that you had created against them and was in there with them, didn't just send them an encouraging email or text, but gets in there with them and he's walking around in the fire with them. How I many you know that'd be good grounds to be freaking out if you're Nebuchadnezzar? Talk to me in this room. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar says, uh, um, Did we not throw three guys in the fire? But one, two, three, we know it can at least count to four. Four. There's four in the fire, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said. That's what that devilish leader said. <laughs> Woo, our God is able. Would you shout, our God is able? Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And so they come out, and everybody's checking them out. Can you imagine? Somebody's just come out of a fiery furnace. Can you imagine? You couldn't take your eyes off of them. You'd be looking for something, man. Dang, man, I still smell his cologne. He doesn't even smell like smoke. What are you saying? That smell of what you've gone through is a king that we must put our foot on its neck. God doesn't want you to always smell like the hell that you've gone through. He doesn't want you to smell like the bondages of your past. Come on, somebody. He doesn't want you to smell like the, the, the hurts and the disappointments and the bad decisions and the bad choices and the bad alliances and the things that just flat out stunk in your life. He wants you to know that he will help you and you need to not allow it and accommodate it but today you need to put your foot on the neck of that 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 smell king smell that thing you don't want to smell like what you've been through look at somebody and say trust me you don't want to smell like what you've been through one of the reasons worship is so important I'm going to say it again. One of the reasons why worship is so important is because it has an aroma that changes the atmosphere. Ministry. Trust me on this one. Ministry becomes, and it deals with so much stuff and issues and stinky people problems. We all better be glad because you either got some today or you've had some. But the thing I love about worship is incense burned in the Old Covenant was a type and shadow of what worship is. And when we worship God, we bring the incense of His presence which covers the stink of what ministry brought us out of and how ministry got involved. You see, I got a white collar on the day, but I've been a blue collar preacher my whole ministry. I ain't never avoided broken people. I've never avoided messed up people. I've never, I've never, I've never shunned them. And that's the reason why, you know, giving mercy to everybody else's family, I would be anything other than just offended and I can't afford to get offended if people didn't give mercy and grace to my family because I've tried to help pick up every family that ever messed up in, 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 in my life since I've been in ministry. 
But worship, the beautiful thing about worship is even when we deal with stinky things, worship offers up an incense that causes us to no longer smell like what we used to be, but we smell like an aroma of sacrifice to Jesus who's brought us up and brought us out. Are you grateful that everything can change? Put your foot on the neck of King's smell. Lazarus was dead four days. His sister comes out. I know they want some to roll the stone away. But dear God, my brother stinks. <laughs> King James, by now he stinketh. <laughs> wow, what putrefaction is set in? The boy is dead. By now he stinks. But something so powerful. Something so powerful if my, if my iPad will mind its own business and stay on. Hallelujah. Everyone say, he's back. Praise God. <laughs> he, Jesus was teaching, even if things stink, go ahead and believe. Even if he's dead and stinking, go ahead and believe. They believe he, Jesus can do miracles. Jesus can do healings. Oh, but Jesus can do more than that. Because when the stone rolls away, Zacchaeus does not, excuse me, Zacchaeus, he got something else. He's another guy for another story. Lazarus, hallelujah. Zach, you are worthy of honorable mention, brother. You got in the sermon somehow, hallelujah. But, but, but Lazarus doesn't need a healing. Lazarus doesn't need a miracle. Lazarus needs something all new. And Jesus stands up in front of that tomb in the midst of a stinky situation situation and says Lazarus come forth and he called him out of that situation <laughs> so cantankerous ornery kids they pulled a prank on their grandpa they got some old Limburger cheese which is some of the stinkiest of all time cheese isn't it amazing that the cheese can taste so good some of it smells so bad. I wonder how we've ever eaten it. I have never eaten Limburger cheese, probably will not. But I have eaten Parmesan. You don't really want to think too much about the smell of Parmesan cheese. Anyhow, that's another message for another time. That's an editorial. Now for the rest of the story. And uh, they put some Limburger cheese on Grandpa's mustache while he was sleeping. Hey, one of them handlebars. Yeah, there you go. You know, Harley Davidson handlebar kind of a mustache. He wakes up and goes, rude awakening. Dear God, this bedroom stinks. Walks in the kitchen. Go make him a cup of coffee. Man, this kitchen stinks. Walks in the living room. Kids are just sort of, Watching. Man, the living room stinks. Runs out on the porch and goes, My God, the whole world stinks. <laughs> <laughs> Got to put your foot on the, the, that senses, that thing that says, No, you're always going to. You're always going to be reminded by the stink of what was. Everyone say, Heaven, no, I won't. Your neighbor say, heaven no, baby. Praise God. I will. No, 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 no. Why? Because I'm putting my foot on it. I don't, I'm nothing like I used to be. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Is anybody grateful for that? And if you are living too close to the old life, get away from it. Put your foot on the neck of the king. Don't run with him. Drag him out of the cave, out of the dark. Put your foot on his neck. Then there's the sense of feeling. That king, the sense of feeling. Isaac was near his passing. He was about to die. And he was going to pass a blessing on to the firstborn son. He had intended to pass the blessing to Esau. What's really kind of wild is really neither Esau or Jacob, either one, is anybody that you would even consider remotely spiritual. Isn't it amazing how that God doesn't just work with you perfect people? But he works with people that have got some issues. 
And he, he, he's, he's not celebrating your issues. He's not even tolerating your issues. He's not, he's not magnifying your issues. But if his hand is on your life, that issue is not going to be a part of your life forever. But Jacob, deceiving little joker, him and his mama get into this conspiracy. It's in the Bible. And she says, you've got to get the blessing because she cared. She loved Jacob more than Esau. And Isaac loved Esau more than Jacob. And here's a reason why you shouldn't love one kid more than the other. You can't always celebrate kids at the same level because sometimes kids disqualify themselves from a lot of honor. But they should never feel like you love them any different in the sense of what you give toward them. Well, anyhow. And, and uh, so she says, he said, well, Mama, how, how can I do this? We'll go into your daddy. He can't see. It's wild, isn't it? He can't, he's blind, he's bad, can't see. Well, Mama, Jacob is like, he's, he's as hairy as an ape, and I'm smooth. He said, we can fix that. Got some goat hair. Put it on his arms. It's in the Bible. Put it on his arms, and he goes in and says, Father, this is Esau. And Jacob said, excuse me, Isaac said, you sound like Jacob. But you feel like Esau. And he trusted his feeling over what he was certain of. And he blessed the one he did not expect to bless. And when that blessing was passed, it could not be taken back. Fickle feelings will mess you up. You may have a handicap issue of some sort in your life. And you could... Go in a lot of different directions with the statement I made because you can be physically well but be handicapped in other areas. But uh, when, 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 when feelings say to you, you know, you, need to, you might ought to need to do this, but you don't have that certainty in your spirit, you need to put your foot on that thing's neck. Are you listening to me? The unintended son stole the birthright, birthright on Noah's ark. This is funny. Noah's Ark, all these animals get on the boat. And contrary to us, they didn't, didn't know animals fight. The Bible doesn't say anything about it, fights breaking out with animals. Isn't that wild? I mean, that's, that's just amazing to me. They're all on that boat together. Hey, look, there's one boat. I might want to eat you, but we've got to get along on this boat. Preacher, how do you know you weren't there? You weren't there either. <laughs> and I'm not preaching this as doctrine not now, right now. I'm, I'm using an illustration. The key was to making sure that everything was okay. The one key was you had to keep the woodpeckers above the water line. Because <laughs> there's always some of those pecker heads. <laughs> If you don't put your foot on the neck of that kind of a spirit, it'll cause the whole boat to sink. <laughs> it is good. I made, I made you laugh as I thrust the sword into you there. So if that ought a woodpecker, we're keeping you above the water line. You don't want me no more? Yeah, we just want you to learn how to peck at the right times, at the right place, on the right thing. Don't take down the boat. Rock the boat. Don't rock the boat, baby. Rock the boat. Don't tip the boat over. I ain't got nothing to do with woodpeckers, but it. That's close as I've come to singing in three days. Whew. Appreciate a good, strong voice. The third king, we need to put our foot on its, its, its neck, is the sense of what we see. In, in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, the enemy had encircled in around about where the prophet Elisha was. And one of his servants went out to check out the situation. And he comes back. Man, he's afraid. And he says, this is what's happening, Elisha. And Elisha looks at him. And he says, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes. And he looked. And he saw chariots of fire. 
He saw angels all over the place. And he realized that there was more with Elijah and he than there was of the enemy. What are you talking about? Put your foot on the neck of the sense of what you see. You may see the enemy, but you can also see angels. If you're only seeing devils, you can also see angels. If you're only seeing problems, you can also see promises. What are you willing to look at? Are you willing to find God in the midst of crazy circumstances? Are you willing to search Him out? Because He's always available. Have you called on His name? Are you looking unto Him? Are you looking looking for him? Are you looking for what he can produce? Are you looking for somebody, a person to do what only Jesus can do? Look, money can't do what Jesus can do, and people can't do what Jesus can do, and resources can't do what Jesus can do, and drugs and sex and perversion cannot do what Jesus can do, and just keep on running the gamut. They can't do what Jesus can do, but Jesus can give you a vision of what you need to see about your situation, and I've come to tell some Somebody today that there's more with us than there is with them. Put your foot on the thing that you see. It's neck that king. Put your foot on his neck. Don't, don't tolerate it. Slay it. Like the person, the spirit. Focus on what God says. It'll change what you see. Ow! I might knock and scream and sing right now, but I can still rap if I need to. <laughs> That's not funny. Well, you just sat there and stared. <laughs> Maybe it's not that I wouldn't laugh. You just scared me. You shot me. You're preaching, and next thing I know, Dear God, you went 50 cent on us or something. I don't know. <laughs> Lecrae, Lecrae. I went Lecrae on thee. <laughs> Focus on what God says. It'll change what you see. Put your foot on that king of what you see that you don't want to see anymore. It looks impossible, but God is able, and nothing is impossible to him. That phrase has been said so many times from the mouths of humans. But it is so true. God is able. And might I add, God is willing. If T.D. Jakes was here, he's not so I say it like him one time. It's because I say, can he would say, God is willing. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Then he'd raise the roof and the Organ would fire up and and people go to bucking and shout. <laughs> Do you believe in that? You doggone straight. It's that dead stuff I don't believe in. Anyhow. The fourth king we need to put our foot on his neck is the king or sense of what you hear. We have to control what we're willing to hear. I'm going to say that again. We have to control. We get to control. But we certainly also have to control what we're willing to hear. Elijah says, after putting his face between his knees, that's some serious prayer. So serious that some of us cannot get in that position. Not only was Elijah getting down to business, but Elijah was a limber prophet. <laughs> I probably could put my head between my knees, but I'm not going to try that in this black suit. <laughs> but after praying and sending out a messenger to see, he said, I hear a sound of abundance. I hear a sound of abundance. What are you hearing? Are you only hearing the devil and not hearing God? Oh, you only hear what stupid people say. Don't mean to be so rough, but some people have made the choice to be stupid. Doesn't mean they can't change. Stupid can be stupid people can change. But stupid is not an accident. Stupid is a decision. 
Stupid is a position that you find a way to get into when you make those kind of choices. Is that the only thing you're hearing? Or do you hear the sound of abundance? He said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And rain represents the help of the Holy Spirit, the touch of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the freshness, the newness of the Holy Spirit. David, God, he says to God, Lord, what do I do about this enemy that's come and done harm to me and my people? God said, David, I want you to wait. Wait till you hear the sound of marching, of going in the tops of the mulberry bushes. I want you to wait till you hear what I tell you you need to hear. When you hear that sound, that's when I want you to move. We need to believe what God says about our kids. We need to believe what God says about our home. We need to believe what God says about our future and our dream and so forth and so on. In my notes, I put dot, dot, dot. What does that mean? Etc. and so forth. Hallelujah. Yes. I ought to, I ought to put some raise your hands I, uh, emoticons. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah. No matter what you've heard and how bad or challenging it is, no matter how hurtful it was, deceptive or painful it was, it's not above God's Word. What will you choose to listen to? You have the ability to choose. Would you clap your hands to Jesus because we have this great ability to choose. What will you hear today? What will you hear today? Will you hear our God is able? Or will you listen to that stinking, stupid demon that's trying to whisper in your ear? Not you, though. Not you. Not, not you. Maybe everybody else, but, 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 but not you. You're too bad. You've gone too wrong. You're too messed up. He's lying to you. You are the one God wants. And God is able to set you free. God is able to elevate your life. He is able to turn your life around. He is able to make your house a home. He is able to heal you where you hurt. He is able to fix everything that's broken. And He's able to send you forth. He's able to change you so much that not only does He bring you out, but he sends you forth and uses your life to affect and change culture. I'm just going to preach it. I'm calling you out of the mess. God is able and I'm going to speak a prophetic word that will release you at the right time to go into what God wants to do with your life. Because people do crazy things because they're not doing what God wants them to do. Any of us. That's why we did it. The devil will encourage anything that doesn't do what God wants. And it's amazing how undealt with senses will fall right in line. Undealt with feelings and hearings. And in this situ situation, that king of what you hear, put your foot on his neck. Because if you don't, it's going to try to talk to you again. But when you put your foot, look, I'm going to take you, hallelujah, I'm going to take you to the woods just a minute. Somebody, I, there have been times, if you're an anti-hunter, it's okay. There's still grace for you. I understand that you might not like it. But if you're a meat eater, you need to kind of watch your mouth. Because if somebody didn't slay the animal, you'd still just be eating veggies. And that's what you'd be eating. But, but, but when I harvest a gobbler and I run up on him and he's doing all kinds of acrobatics because I have shot him in the head with a 12-gauge shotgun. <laughs> and he's flopping around. I run over and I put my foot on his neck. I don't stomp his head because I want to. I'm about to get a picture with him. We're gonna, we're gonna take a picture. A, a nussy. What's a nussy? It's when you, it's more than a selfie. Selfie is just you and us. Is us. And you know what? He can't get away. He'll never do what he did again. And the analogy is this. When you put your foot on that thing's neck, slay that demon effect in your life. 
so that you never have to deal with that one again. And I'm almost done. Anthony looked at Bernie and said, there is a God. <laughs> My Lord, have mercy, there is a God. He's almost done with time to spare. I wonder what he's taking. <laughs> Stuff that ain't been working. It ain't none of it made me mad. Ain't helped to lick. It ain't made me sleep. I'm trying to stop y'all. The final, the final king, we must put our foot on his head. Everybody say it. God is able. God is, able. is the king of taste. In 2 Kings chapter 4, love these old great stories. There were a group of young prophets learning, sitting at the feet of Elisha, the great prophet of God. A famine was in a certain region where they were, and so there's, no, there's nothing to eat. And Elisha sends out one of the men to make a stew, to get some things to make a stew for these sons of the prophets. It's a dangerous thing to send a man to the grocery store by himself. And if some of you women are like my wife, I just got to believe. I might be wrong, but it seems like at times she writes that list in a way that keeps me. <laughs> I tell people while I'm in there, I say, my wife has got to be home, rolling and chuckling. <laughs> this is how she gets even with me. She sends me to get groceries at Walmart. And she won't let me stay on the one aisle. I know she probably doesn't do it on purpose, but I blame her. And, uh, but anyhow, look, there wasn't no grocery store. There's famine. And they, they're trying to find something to make a stew with. They would have appreciated a preacher that harvests long beer turkeys. <laughs> Man. <laughs> and it took turkeys, turkey sandwiches. How many know a sandwich is eight? That's a whole other level of sandwich. A sandwich. You don't know that. You get around the right people. They'll, they'll teach you the difference. Old folk taught me that. And so uh, they start gathering just different herbs and things. And they grabbed something that was from a wild vine. They wasn't sure what it was. But they were so hungry. Well, you know, we'll just see. <laughs> and they start putting it in the stew pots in the Bible. 2 Kings chapter 4. And they, they, they start putting it in the stew pot and they're cooking the stew. And man, these guys are hungry. You know, the famine is a force fast. And man, they're, they're hungry and wanting to eat. But they put it out in the bowls or whatever. And one of them tastes and says, Oh, Master, there's death in the pot. Poison in the pot. <laughs> Sideline. Side note here. I've tasted some food before that might not kill you. But I could relate to what the guy said. <laughs> you get tempted to cut your tongue off. It tasted so bad. But you know you're going to need your tongue for another day and another meal. Oh, thank God there's another meal coming. <laughs> but there was death in the pot. There was poison in the pot. But what, they, what, what Elisha said, look, put some meal in it. Put some meal in the pot and it'll be okay. What does that mean? That meal represents to us the bread of life. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. You put Jesus in the poison situation, and he'll turn a poisonous situation into something that can satisfy your soul and feed you in famine times and bring you forth out of whatever terrible situation that you're in. Put Jesus in it. Don't push Jesus away. Put Jesus in it. If the situation you're in, you can't put Jesus in because Jesus would have no part of it, get away from that. But put Jesus in the poisonous situation You'll be surprised what he can do. He'll change it. Faith places limitations. No limitations. Oh, praise the Lord. 
That's a whole different point. I got my glasses on. Faith places. I pushed him on so hard. It hurt. <laughs> Lord, I was trying to be cool. I had to hurt myself. Place, faith, places, faith places no limitations on God, and God places no limitations on faith. Confess that with me right now. Faith places no limitations on God, and God places no limitations on faith. Turn to somebody on your right and say, hey, faith places no limitations on God, and God places no limitations on faith. Look at someone and say, uh, I feel my help coming. Look at him and tell somebody else and say, faith places no limitations on God, and God places no limitations on faith. Now shout just a minute, because that's good news about a God who's able. So you people that are just waiting on the Lord, but you ain't believing for nothing, not using your faith for anything, just waiting for God to do whatever he wants to do, you better not do that when he gives you the option of believing him, declaring his ableness, saying, Lord, I want your best. I don't want to settle for anything and then wind up blaming you for it. I want your best. I know that you're able, and faith won't put limitations on him. Some of you, to where you are now, to where you were at one time in your life, it's not possible. It's just not possible. It's just not possible. But God did it. God did it. God did it. You put Jesus in the situation and God did it. And he's here today. And as we put his word where the bad taste and the poison is in that situation, it's all changing. Kings dead at the base of the altar. We put our foot on your necks because we cannot be what we're supposed to be and let those evil senses live. Would you stand all over this room? I sure love y'all. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this weekend. Thank you, dear God, for what you did in Boonville last night and the night before. Thank you, dear God, for giving me voice to share your word. Thank you for the people that are in this room today that have heard from you. Some, Lord, realize somebody more than that Owensby guy is talking to me. There's a person or persons in this room right now that you need Jesus in your life. You need to put Jesus in in the core of the situation of your life. You've had no place for him in that area. Or maybe you've had no place for him in your life. And maybe things have really gone sour. And things have really gone south in your life. But I would love to pray with you today. I would love to lead you to Jesus today. I would love to introduce you to him today. I would love for you to experience a freedom in him that you can't find in any other way. And I want to right now, I want to lead this house in a prayer. And I know maybe, maybe your life is troublesome right now. But God's not hiding from you. He showed up today to help you. And he's not slapping you on the back of the head and shoving your nose down in those things. But he's saying, I'm glad you're finally coming to yourself. I'm glad you're finally experiencing an awakening. Because I've been here all along. I was here before it all went crazy. But I sure won't forsake you now. Because I've been in faith, the Lord says. I've been praying. Jesus, the Bible says, is ever interceding at the right hand of the Father. He's been praying for you. In this place right now, I want to lead everybody in this prayer. I'm going to make a special prayer available in a few moments. But I'm going to ask everyone in this room, everyone watching in whatever capacity that you are, even if you're listening to this podcast and God's got you to this point, I want to pray a prayer with you that will change your life forever if you mean it. God will do it. He's able. But if your heart's in what you're about to say, your heart's about to be changed by the power of a risen Christ. But everybody pray this with me right now. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I ask you, Lord, 
to cleanse me, to come into my life, to be the Lord of my life. Right now, especially the Savior of my life. Because a lot of things have messed me up where you were not previously available because I had not given you any place. But today, I'm inviting you in. Today, I swing wide open the door of my life. Come in, Lord Jesus. Today, I give you my heart. I hold nothing back. I'm going to follow you by your grace and mercy. And I'm not leaving this place bound. I'm leaving this place forgiven because I believe you're able. And I believe you're honoring your word. And you're true to what you say. And you're not playing games with me. You love me so much that you've gotten up in my business to show me how much better my life can be when I open my life to you. I love you, Jesus. I choose to trust you, Jesus. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And I'll never turn back. If I were to stumble, I will get back up but I will never turn back. Would you clap your hands to Jesus all over this room? If you're in this place, I'm about to make prayer available for you. If you're in this place and there's some kings that you've got to put your foot on their neck today, there's some situations in your life that you really, today's the day, and you're ready to, you've received forgiveness, but you want to see total removal and total defeat of what has plagued your life before. And you want that kind of a breakthrough. I want you right now to just step out and come. Won't do any weird things, but I want to pray with you and believe God with you. God bless you, dear. Who else in Jesus' name? People are coming from around the room waiting for you. Honey, would you please hand me that bottle of water? God bless you, sweetheart. I love you. People are continuing to come. Thank you, dear. Let's hold that top, please. From around the room, who else? In Jesus' name. Brother, I need some extra help from God. Come, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I've got some praying voice left. I'd love to pray with you. Love to believe God with you on your behalf. Won't do anything weird, but we're going to turn... God loose by His power and His Spirit. You need some God stuff in your life. Please let Andy know that I'm praying for Larry. Let him know that I got that text, would you? Thank you, Cindy. Praise God. Sorry, y'all. I went to a personal conversation for a minute. <laughs> but that's the advantage I have. I'm looking at all of you at the same time. Y'all looking at me. But who else in Jesus' name before I pray with these? Because there's some others. There's some others. Make that move. It's time for evilness, evil strongholds, false kings, for you to put your foot on the neck to destroy the one who's been plaguing your life. Who else in Jesus' name? Everybody who prayed that prayer and meant it, God's forgiven you. But now listen to me. Don't try to do like the kings now that you're redeemed. God bless these precious ones that are coming. I love you guys. God bless you. Would you give these people a God bless you? I love their courage. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't know what I was saying. I just you know what the Lord wanted me to say. I guess I said the right thing. Or maybe I just waited long enough. Sometimes it ain't what I say. Sometimes it's just give people enough time to make up their mind. Is today the day or are you going to put it off again? It's today. This is the time, isn't it? And here's the thing. We've got light today. We've got a revelation today of what we need to put our foot on and where we need to put our foot on its neck. The devil's going down today in the lives of you that are standing in front of me. There are others. Look, you may be a person who loves God. But you got this loose king in your life. 
and you need to defeat him today. Or he's going to bother you tomorrow. He'll probably mess with you before the afternoon's over. Take him down today in the name of Jesus. Dear Fred and I have this mutual love. We love the Old Testament because we love that old warrior spirit those guys had. They weren't heartless and ruthless. They just, if, if, if it was evil, it, it had to be dealt with with force. That's what deliverance means, to be set. <laughs> I really liked it too, I know why. Deliverance means to be set free by a force greater than the oppressor. You that are standing in front of me, I love you. I'm going to come by. I'm going to pray with you personally. Uh, Quinn, I need you. Elder Kendall, I need you. Noah Owensby, if you can. I know y'all got an appointment. If you have to go, I understand. I'm sorry. That's right. You told me you had to. I understand. Got that wedding to go to. But, but come. God bless you, Eli. Thank you. In Jesus' name. I'm with you. Son, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Daddy, call me out. I can't leave now. I don't want him. I don't want him to. I, I don't want him to. I don't want him to feel that way. He said we're gonna have to leave right at the end of the service. <coughs> he must have thought I was gonna preach to one. I don't know, but but anyhow, you that are standing in front of me, I love you. Celebrate you. Freedom. Freedom is yours today. We're about to drop our foot on the neck of the enemy. Church family, would you extend your hand toward these right now as we pray? By the way, if you have to go, you are dismissed. If you need to go, nobody will condemn you. But if you want to hang out a little bit and just watch what God might do, you're welcome to do that. If you want to just stay and add your agreement, you're welcome to do that. But if you have to go, nobody has changed you to the chair. We understand and we love you. And it's been an honor having you today. God bless you.